what about in young people? So it, it's really mm -hmm. fascinating because, you know, like I, when I think about mortality risk, I think of like an older person going in, doing a battery of tests, getting all their blood work done and, you know, trying to do their grip strength and breathing to do that, you know, and I think about, so I think about more of like things that are being measured and, and aggregated together to come up with this frailty, frailty index. But for someone who's younger, like in their 30s, like, and they go and do all this stuff, like, I don't know that it's really going to be a good predictor mm -hmm. of their mortality. I mean, they're young, mm -hmm. you know, they've got pretty good lung function. They're, you know, you know what I mean? So yeah. is this where grim age may mm -hmm. shine? Like if you, if you have a 30 year old or 25 year old and they do their grim age, Mm -hmm. Does it like accurately predict mortality risk? Yeah, so we don't have these really, really long follow-up studies, but at least the preliminary data seems that it's going to be much better for young people because exactly as you said, these functional things are going to have what we consider either a floor or ceiling effect. So for most people below some certain age, they're all going to perform well on it. They're not at a level where they're seeing dysfunctional decline yet, which goes back to this idea of biological age versus functional age. Um, whereas the epigenetic clocks are meant to capture more this biological, molecular, cellular aging that we think will eventually feed into that. So if you can say, oh, you're aging faster at a molecular level than we'd expect, we'll also expect you down the road probably to have these functional manifestations earlier, even if we can't see them yet. So I, I totally agree. In younger people, when these things haven't really emerged, this is kind of the only way to kind of proxy who might be heading in that direction. Totally. I mean, you can't look in the mirror and go, I've got more DNA damage today. Like, you know, like, <laughs> exactly. you're not, yeah. like, but you could be. And, and, and lifestyle factors do play a role. And you could have someone who is in their, you know, 30s and they just, they're sort of just living a hard life. Mm -hmm. And perhaps um, they wouldn't, they wouldn't pick up on those sort of functional declines yet. Yeah. But this is where something that is uh, more measuring something biological, uh, you know, at the molecular level that is, that's going to kind of open their eyes. So, um, but I, it, I kind of wanted to shift gears and talk a little bit about this age, epigenetic age acceleration. I mean, we've been mm -hmm. sort of talking about how people age at different rates. I think you were a co-author on one of those, one of the studies like a few years back that um, was one of the big ones that came out where it was like, people age at different rates and there was like 18 biomarkers that were looked mm -hmm. at and I think it was PNAS or something. PNAS oh yeah, yeah, the Belsky paper. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. And and it was like, look at people are aging at different rates and, and you can even look at their faces and it correlates with their yeah. you know biological age more than their chronological age. And yep. um, so so to me, there you know clearly there's lifestyle factors, environmental factors that are that play a role in the way you age. Um, can you explain to people what epigenetic age acceleration is and what some of the most robust biological, environmental, perhaps social mm -hmm. causes of age, epigenetic age acceleration are? Yeah, so, so we usually use this term age acceleration to just mean kind of the discordance between your chronological age, so the age you know that you are, and your predicted age based on whether it's grim age or pheno age or any of these epigenetic clocks. Um, and that, again, is we think it's biologically meaningful. So someone who's predicted much older than they are chronologically are people who are higher risk for disease or mortality. Um, and so, you know, the next question is why are some people predicted older and other people are predicted younger? Um, and a lot of people think, oh, it's just genetic. You know, I you know, maybe my family is just high risk, but actually it seems to have very little impact on your epigenetic age. So I think they estimate like 10, maybe at the uppermost 20% impact, your genes have that kind of impact on your epigenetic aging rate. And actually probably the majority of it is environment and lifestyle. Um, and when we look, again, these are not clinical trials, it's looking at epidemiological data. So just saying, in the population, the people who are predicted to be older versus people who are predicted to be younger, what are their characteristics? Um, we find things that are not surprising. So socioeconomic status is a big thing in terms of differences in epigenetic age, but also behaviors. So smoking really accelerates to your epigenetic age. Uh, generally, exercise will tend to decrease epigenetic age. Eating, we think, 
probably plant-based diet is going to decrease epigenetic age. Um, and then, yeah, a lot of the things don't drink heavily, get, you know, good quality sleep, minimize stress, all, all the things that everyone's mother and grandmother told them to do in life. How does, um, how does the male, being a male, mm -hmm. affect epigenetic age? Because males live on average, what, four years? Like, their, their yeah. lifespan's like four or so years shorter, shorter. than females, right? Yep. Is that reflected in epigenetic Yeah, it, it is reflected in epigenetic age. So on average, not, again, not across the board, but if you look at the distributions, females on average will have slower or lower epigenetic age than same age, okay. same chronological Similar age. Similar question. Um, females undergo menopause when, they're, yes. when they reach like 50s or something like that. Yep. Um, plus or minus, you know, I don't know how many years, but how does menopause affect epigenetic aging? Yeah, so this is actually a study I did while I was in C4 Bath Lab. So we looked at women who undergone menopause and how long since they'd gone, undergone menopause. And it seems to be that menopause is actually an epigenetic aging accelerated event. So before menopause, women are doing pretty well. And then when they go through menopause, it seems to accelerate their epigenetic age. And we didn't have the kind of data you would want where we'd have the same women pre and post, but um, we can even look at surgical menopause. And that seems to also show this kind of accelerated epigenetic aging kind of manifestation. That kind of leads me into a, another question, um, which is, does the change, do the changes in this, these methylation patterns that you and others are measuring, um, does it, a, is it pretty stable over the lifespan or are they like, you know, like once you hit midlife, you know, cause like mm -hmm. there's functional aging that really starts to yeah. hit you, you know, you start to get like, you know, mid, mid, late to midlife and then it starts to go down. Right. So does the epigenetic clock mirror that or is it pretty stable? So it's not stable, but it actually doesn't mirror what we think of in terms of functional aging. So if you think of a frailty index or even mortality risk, it increases exponentially after let's say age 30. Um, the epigenetic clock show a totally different pattern. It's still not linear, but actually most of the changes happen during development. So you have this huge increase in epigenetic age between, we can even measure it in fetal samples. Um, and then it kind of starts becoming more linear and steady around age 20. And then interestingly actually slows down again in, you know, very late. So after let's say age 80. Um, we don't know why these patterns look this way, but yeah, it's not perfectly stable across the life course. Okay, this leads to a couple of other <laughs> questions you brought, uh, that you know sort of came in my mind. One is then what about when people get you know disease states? So like they do get type two diabetes or mm -hmm. cardiovascular disease. You know, does that then being in that disease state mm -hmm. in that functional decline like state does that accelerate the aging? So I don't know if we actually know that because we don't have very good, the problem with epigenetic data right now is we don't have good kind of time course data. We're not mm -hmm. following people longitudinally. There are very few studies that do this. Um, there are more studies that are starting to, um, but I don't think we've reached the point to say, I can look at someone's epigenetic aging pre-disease state and then see what happens after they've developed some disease. But I would imagine that it would, probably kind of snowball and accelerate. And we do know, not looking at epigenetics, that it, once you get a disease, it's actually a shorter time to each subsequent disease. So there does seem to be this kind of accelerating event in aging that occurs. Biobank data might be a good source. They do yeah. a lot of, you know, yeah. it's like they've got just tons and tons of samples that are, you know, because they have people come in for like routine. Yep. You know, yeah, so we've talked to them. The problem is that the epigenetic data is not super cheap. So, you know, to do that many people that many times, yeah, you have to come up with quite a bit of funding to be able to be, do It that. would be interesting. It definitely yeah, be no, interesting. <laughs> I'm all for this. The more, the more data samples we can get, I think the better we'll be able to figure this all out.